course. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight for our latest uh, webinar from the Sussex East Sussex Eye Group. So as usual, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available to watch later on on our YouTube channel, the East Sussex Eye Group. There is one C CPD point for optometrists and IP speciality optometrists for this event. And that's if you're watching it live through the link when you registered. Um, and I will upload CPD certificates hopefully this weekend. So the lecture will run for about 45 minutes with time at the end for questions. And as usual, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type your questions in there and then I will put them to our guest speaker at the end of the webinar. So for tonight, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Mr. Pantelisianidis. After finishing his medical school training in Italy, he then went on to complete his ophthalmic surgical training in Athens, working at the University Pediatric Hospital and at the prestigious Red Cross Hospital of Athens. He moved to Wales to join the ophthalmology department in the Singleton Hospital in Swansea in 2011 and was there for two years before becoming part of the ophthalmology team in the East Sussex NHS Trust. In order to expand his anterior segment experience, he completed two years of an honorary clinical attachment at the corneal plastic unit at the Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead, alongside his job at East Sussex. Currently, he's a consultant ophthalmic surgeon with special interest in anterior segment conditions and medical retina, as well as being the ophthalmology clinical governance lead and has recently become the clinical league for uh, ESHT uh, at East Sussex NHS Trust. So, Mr. Ionidis, thank you very much. I would like to hand over to you now for your talk. Thank you very uh, much, Ian, for um, the spontaneous introduction. And thank you very much for um, asking me to uh, host this, uh, this, this webinar. Um, I'm going to start uh, right away with our topic, which is... Um, hold on a second. As the topic says, a day in the life of an autometrist in eye casualty. Um, this is uh, practically um, uh, what I did is actually I stalked one of our uh, optometrists, uh, our head optometrist who does uh, eye casualty, in order to show what an optometrist in, um, in eye casualty sees and how they handle the situation. Most of the times there is a, a consultant to, to ask questions and advice, but sometimes uh, the consultant might not be available or there might be in case of an annual leave and the, uh, and the admin staff has not um, put that in consideration and the casualty continues to run. So some, in some cases, the um, uh, optometrist didn't have uh, the advice that you would expect uh, from a senior member of staff. So this is just a, a sample of uh, what, um, an optometrist can see in our, our eye casualty and how they handle the situation most of the times uh, on their own and sometimes with the advice of a consultant. Um, this is just to show that the more you see cases, the more confident you get uh, on dealing with them. So uh, just a very vague summary uh, regarding our uh, population here. So we, 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 we're located in East Sussex, the sunniest coast in the UK. We have around a population of around 600,000. In our trust, uh, their new referrals uh, from last year, these are proper numbers, actual numbers, were around 17,000 patients. These were the new referrals. And our outpatient activity uh, for this time frame was around 64,000 appointments. As you understand, the, the, this vast number of patients needs to be seen in a timely manner. At the end of the day, the, our workforce here in East Sussex are, we have our consultant body of uh, 10 consultants. We have two associate specialists, very experienced ones, four specialty doctors, again, very experienced doctors, and uh, four registrars in rotation. Our optometrist workforce is around 10 uh, or 11. Some of them are part-time, some, and some of them are full-time. And our this body is around six, um, as, as in total, most of them are, um, are full-time. So this, uh, this is the, the, the workforce that we have to, 
see these uh, 60 uh, 4,000 uh, appointments. Um, as you understand, what you this body you cannot be seen uh, of patients cannot be seen by only the doctors. So we need to do something. What do we need? We need to have somebody like a multi tool um, or uh, or a switch knife. Uh, and who is there to be able to do this uh, besides uh, our doctors? So who are you going to call? in order to do this and solve this problem. Our fellow optometrists, they're the one, and why? They know very well anatomy of the eye. They're familiar with the patients because uh, most of these patients, when they come for their consultation, are regular patients, and, they are, and the patients are familiar with the optometrists, and um, they can discuss all the cases and their concerns. Optometrists have more are more familiar to use less medical terms in order to explain the conditions to the patients. They know about the eye, they know about the conditions, and they can do a full and thorough examination like I would do without any big difference, uh, to be honest. So what we're gonna do today is uh, follow uh, one of our optometrists on the cases that uh, she has seen in clinic. Um, totally, I'm gonna discuss about 12 cases. Um, this did not happen in, not in one day. Our head of promises actually saw eight cases and then I added another four. So it's a day and a half, to be honest, in, 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 the, in the time um, uh, that an optometrist, our local optometrist has seen these cases. I'm going to start with the first case. These are all our cases. Our photographs are done by us. Maybe the quality might not be perfect, but you're going to have an idea. Um, we have first an 85 year old patient had um, cataract surgery in both eyes and in the left eye had the procedure that's called endocyclo diode laser and the patient had previous glaucoma was not using any drops in the meantime that patient noticed blurred vision and pain for a month and there was an optometrist that had a, a visit at home and they found very poor vision in the right eye poor vision in the left and the pressure in the right eye was 99. So that uh, patient was referred in clinic right away. And it was confirmed that the pressure was like 99 in the right eye. And with the uh, acclimation tonometry, it was around 70. Uh, bear in mind that this case uh, and the symptoms were for at least a month. Now, um, this is actually a photograph of the, the eye of the patient. This is the left eye that had the previous uh, uh, procedure endocyclodiode laser. And this is also uh, the right eye. It's a little bit difficult to see here, but uh, you, there is iris block with iridocorneal touch and there is complete angle closure and the iris is pushed forward along with a, with a lens. So it's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see here the iridocorneal touch and the whole IOL and um, is is displaced uh, forward. This is the OCT scan, the disc OCT scan, and the macular OCT scan. So, if you notice in the beginning, the left eye had poor vision as well, and this is because there is a macular degeneration, there is scarring from dry macular degeneration. So uh, that's why the vision is poor in the left eye, and in the right eye, you see the macula appears to be fine but unfortunately uh, the patient had this uh, issue. Um, hold on, sorry for this, a small glitch. On the OCT scan of the um, left eye, you can see that the disc appears to be fine because the patient had previous uh, ECP, uh, so endocyclodiode laser, but on the right eye we cannot see it and definitely there's damage to the optic nerve. So uh, treatment for that high of pressure, you know it's start, uh, Oral dimox that was one gram of oil, one gram, not one milligram, one gram of oral dimox uh, with uh, iopidine and uh, cosopt, that would be dozolamide and timolol to lower or to start lowering the pressure. This was a particular case because it was not treated as a um, acute closure glaucoma rather than an aqueous misdirection. Uh, the first plan was to contact a VR fellow in uh, Brighton, our neighboring trust, to consider having a vitrectomy because uh, due to the ac acute uh, 
or, or to, not the acute, to the urgency of the of the case. Following communication, though, with our fellow, with our colleagues in Brighton, and uh, there was not any visual potential visual rehabilitation. The the whole purpose of the treatment is to uh, keep the eye comfortable and keep the patient comfortable. So, a couple of words about this aqueous misdirection, which is which is something pretty pretty rare, but it does happen. It's a form of secondary angle closure that presents with elevated pressure, very high pressure. Sometimes, though, it can be the pressure cannot be very high, but it's characteristic the shallowing of the central and peripheral uh, anterior chamber. The exact mechanism is is unknown, but it appears to be related with the relationship between the ciliary body, anterior hyaloid face, and the lens. So everything is pushed uh, forward. The aqueous misdirection is a diagnosis of exclusion. So it requires exclusion of other clinical entities like a choroidal hemorrhage, choroidal effusion, and pupillary block. In this case, the slit lamp examination demonstrates shallowing of both the peripheral and central anterior chamber, which is typical in aqueous misdirection. So if you consider the treatment at the beginning, you see there's not any, um, any drops to uh, constrict the pupil, to, so meiotic drops. Uh, the pupil was already mid-dilated, but also you know that even if it was a case of uh, acute glaucoma, pressure more than 35, the uh, meiotic agents uh, don't work. But in this case, uh, cycloplegia is, uh, is indicated. The management in this case is in the beginning, when you have a case like that, um, all the in literature, it says you try for the first four to five days with the medical management. That would be cycloplegics, so dilating drops, and um, uh, aqueous suppressants and hyperosmotics. If after the first four or five days there's not an improvement, then you go to the surgical management. What they do, cycloplegics, what they do, they inhibit the contraction of the uh, ciliary uh, muscle fibers, of the ciliary body, and they cause tightening of the zonals, which puts the lens, places the, the lens backward, the hyperosmotic agents like Dimox, um, acetazolamide, they draw fluid out of the posterior chamber, so they decrease the vitreous volume and pressure. And the aqueous suppressants, the drops, decrease the flow of aqueous that can precipitate aqueous misdirection. So that is the medical management. You can also consider a uh, YAG laser, which is uh, performed to disrupt the anterior hyaluronic phase. Um, and also you can consider doing um, laser iridotomy and through the laser iridotomy, you can actually disrupt the anterior hyaluronic phase in case you don't want to go from the pupillary, from the, from the, from the pupil. Uh, only because in cases where there is visual potential, you don't, maybe you don't want to risk uh, causing damage to the lens or anything like that. But in this case, in this particular case, uh, this has been going on for more than a month. So the visual potential was very limited. The whole purpose was to uh, keep the patient's eye uh, comfortable. And finally, if after a few days of treatment, the pressure doesn't go back, so displacing, creating more space in the anterior chamber, displacing the lens diaphragm back, um, you consider surgical management, which is the anterior vitrectomy VR pars plana. And um, this is what happened to this patient. We tried uh, with medical uh, management first. Uh, after three days of not improving, the, the patient was uh, seen on our neighboring trust in Brighton. They did vitrectomy. Actually, the patient was seen on today's Thursday, on uh, Monday, I believe, uh, or Tuesday. It was no, yesterday, sorry. Yesterday, the patient was seen, and the patient had a little bit of a corneal edema. The pressure was a little bit higher, 20 something, 28, but the, the, the eye was comfortable. There was a little bit of a corneal edema. Uh, that we're treating with um, sodium chloride drops, and we're going to see the patient in a few weeks' time, but the eye is comfortable. Now, um, I'm going to another case that uh, our optometrist has seen in clinic. It's a 58-year-old patient. It was a self-referral, previous recurrent iritis, around 25 episodes uh, between uh, both eyes, Known ankylosine spondylitis. I believe that you are aware that the patients with spondy, uh, um, ankylosine spondylitis can develop uh, iritis. Um, ankylosine spondylitis, uh, it can be seropositive or seronegative. So if people uh, are negative with the HLA B27, doesn't mean 
that uh, they don't have it, uh, they're just uh, seropositive or seronegative. So actually having this test done uh, when there's confirmed ankylosine spondylitis doesn't give you any more or further information. This patient as well has a good history, had a, a big lad stare, so had vitrectomy and cryotherapy in the right eye and subsequent cataract, then had the cataract surgery with multifocal lenses and previous uh, and after that had refractive laser uh, surgery in both eyes. So as you understand, it's a demanding patient, wants good vision, and the vision was very good actually, was 6.6 six in the right eye, and the left eye that had the inflammation was 6 to 7.5. On the examination, there were cells uh, around two, so plus two cells, quite, quite a strong inflammation. There was not any posterior synechia, no KPs, keratic precipitates, and mild conjunctival hyperemia. So there was no posterior, no vitritis, and the macular CT scan was good. So all this was checked thoroughly by our optometrist. There was not any need for any doctor input or anything like that. And um, this is a very nice video, actually. You can see here the cells in the anterior chamber. A very nice video taken by only a phone camera. So amazingly nice. So you can see the stars there. Very nice video. Um, so this patient was started by our optometrist with uh, hourly maxidex uh, for the first day, and then six times a day for a week, and then lowering one drop every week. Um, there was not any need for cycloplegia this time, but sometimes when we see posterior subnychia, we have to also consider um, cycloplegia with um, cyclopentolate for a few days to help or, or prevent uh, synechia. So this patient is gonna be reviewed again in a few weeks time to check the inflammation. All these cases are seen uh, in the last uh, two, three weeks. So uh, we haven't seen the case uh, back to refer to you, but uh, the patient is, gonna is about to be seen in the next three to four weeks, I believe. Next, we have another case, third case. We have a 79 year old patient, uh, glaucoma patient on latanoprost. And that patient had, uh, if you see like a few days ago, 10 days ago, had a FACO uh, surgery and a nice stent, um, small mix drainage device. Um, and the day after the patient accidentally poked their eye with the, with the drops and was very painful. And since then the eye has been more red and more sore. Um, the patient was seen in clinic, the implant was in situ, no issues with the surgery, the eye was fine. But uh, this was noticed, as you can see here, there is this area of bare sclera and uh, this semi-luminar uh, part of the conjunctiva. If somebody doesn't know the history, they can think it, they can, think it can be something like necrotizing scleritis or something, uh, uh, something like that, more devastating, that needs immediate attention. But this patient also had a subtenone injection so an injection to numb uh, the whole eye so for the surgery so the patient would not feel anything and uh, would make the whole procedure more comfortable. So actually this is um, um, the, the part where uh, the patient had the introduction of the needle for the, uh, the cannula, sorry, for the septenon. Um, so there was a large consultative laceration um, with the sclera showing. It's probably for the septenon, for the anesthetic, but probably as the patient poked their eye, this part of the conjunctiva was displaced. That's why you, you could see the bare sclera. We are here, the, the, our optometrist reassured the patient that it will heal on its own and continue with the post-op drops. The patient was discharged from the acute clinic and to continue with the glaucoma drops. And bear in mind, this, like the acute clinic, the, the purpose of the acute clinic, the uh, rapid eye access clinic, is to make sure that there's not something to deal with the acute of the problem, and then uh, the patient can be seen um, in a specialist clinic. So uh, most of the times, uh, the purpose is to exclude something acute, and then the patient to have a regular follow-up in a, in a specialist clinic. Another uh, case, the fourth case, it's a 52-year-old patient referred by the optician, had a previous history of squint surgery in the left eye many years ago, the patient referred that they always had a raised lump as a child where the surgery was done. And occasionally it feels like fluid, a field cyst, which come and go. 
Uh, the patient had a recent four week history of redness, irritation, using lubricants with the easy comfort, but the reduction of the renters of the lamp was uh, not, not achieved. Um, this is a very nice photograph. Uh, you can see this, um, the affected area. You can probably tell from the photograph that is, you have these raised like cystic areas with lots of uh, tiny blood vessels over there. Our optometrist very good uh, thought about instilling some phenylephrine. So this is the photograph uh, before the phenylephrine 2.5%. And this is the photograph after the phenylephrine 2.5%, where there's blanching of the um, superficial blood vessels, and you can see that area affected much, much better. The reason for that is to exclude something that we call scleritis, but also to be able to see this uh, lesion uh, better. So um, in poor words, this examination showed that there is a red raised lump on the temporal conjunctiva with this conjunctival injection. There was the installation of phenylephrine, which did blunt most of the superficial blood vessels, but you can still see the, 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 the lump with the, and the cystic lesions that they were underneath. The plan is to treat with steroids to calm down the inflammation because it's an inflamed part, and reviewing clinic with a doctor who specializes in squint surgery because the patient had previous squint surgery. So we started to use Maxidex four times a day for seven days, and then uh, twice a day for seven days, so in two weeks time, uh, the patient is going to be seen by one of my colleagues who are going to check that area uh, thoroughly. Now, what is the differential diagnosis? And then I'm going to discuss about this uh, the differential diagnosis, and I'm going to tell you my opinion. It could be something that we call a uh, flictenulosis, so a flicten. This is um, a nodular inflammation of the cornea uh, or the conjunctiva that results from hypersensitivity to a foreign antigen. Um, usually, Staphylococcus aureus is the one that is um, uh, responsible. Um, but we have to consider also uh, cases with uh, tuberculosis that can cause this flictenular uh, conjunctivitis, but also herpes and chlamydia or streptococcus can cause this uh, condition. This, um, the flictens are more likely to appear though in the limbal area, so uh, where the cornea and uh, the bulbar conjunctiva starts. So the, and this is more likely for them to be located rather than uh, the conjunctiva. Generally, the, for flicknodulosis, cases of uh, blepharitis, because as mentioned, Staphylococcus aureus is the one that is mostly responsible for that. Uh, we have to advise the patient lead hygiene, warm compresses, lead scrubs, and uh, in um, cases when there is also ocular rosacea, uh, we can consider topical azithromycin and oral doxycycline might be of benefit. Be careful in, because this uh, can happen also in children. Flipinolysis is very common in children as well. Uh, so uh, be careful of uh, considering administering um, doxycycline because it's better to consider erythromycin because tetracyclines like doxycycline can cause uh, dental discoloration. In patients with uh, other diseases like tuberculosis and chlamydia, we have to treat the underlying cause. And chlamydia definitely needs to be treated with azithromycin or doxycycline. I had a patient, 40 year old patient, with a flictenular conjunctivitis right at the limbus. I'm afraid I don't have a photograph. Um, it was treated in the beginning with steroids, Maxidex, for a few weeks, actually, it took like four weeks. And it actually resolved very well. But once the steroids drop, stop, this condition recurred. So if, we're, if, was, if it was a plain uh, case of Staphylococcus aureus uh, flictenulosis, it would resolve. But once it came back, then you start to do further investigations. So we did, um, we did investigate for uh, tuberculosis and chlamydia, which they came back negative. Once they came back negative, I started treatment with uh, oral acyclovir plus the steroids. So the steroids were commenced for another three weeks with the addition of oral acyclovir. And when the steroids stopped, we continued with oral acyclovir and uh, the patient did not have any remission. So apparently it was from uh, herpes simplex. So in the first instance, starting with uh, topical steroids, it's the easiest thing to do. But if it persists, then we need to, we need to consider to start investigating uh, the other uh, causes. 
And the other cause that can potentially cause this lump that the patient had this on the conjunctiva, it's something that we call pyogenic granuloma. They appear like fleshy red, red mass with a relative rapid growth. The lesion is like a fibrovascular response to previous injury or trauma, such as surgery. The incident of this granuloma following strabismus surgery is reported around being 1% of all conjunctival incisions, and it occurs three to four weeks after surgery. So it probably it has, from my, in my opinion, as I saw the photographs, it appears to be a, a conjunctival a pyogenic granuloma rather than um, flitinulosis. Um, in some cases, they can resolve on topical steroids, but I believe in this case, uh, we might have to consider surgical um, in, uh, excision. The risk factors is, as the patient referred, if you see, there was a foreign body, uh, appears to be related to the suture material that it was used. We don't know how many years ago the patient had this squint surgery. Um, in the past, the gut sutures were accused of causing uh, granulomas, but now they are much less frequent. Um, but bear in mind that pyogenic granulomas can occur in, after any incision or trauma to the conjunctiva. And actually, they're very frequent following chalasian excisions. Uh, sometimes you can, uh, have a patient can refer following chalasian excision, like having a lump, a residual lump or a fleshy lump uh, on the site of the chalasian. And this is a pyogenic granuloma that needs further excision. Um, the management is using topical steroids, as we previously mentioned, for a few weeks, uh, with possible surgical excision if it's not uh, resolving with the um, uh, with the topical steroids. Another case, fifth case, it's an 87 year old patient referred by the optician who noticed at the uh, post op check that the eye was still red and there were still cells in the anterior chamber. The patient had cataract surgery in the beginning of December. Uh, so we're talking this, this happened like six weeks after. Um, the patient feels that both eyes are a little bit sticky but has noticed any pain. On examination, there was slight redness uh, in the conjunctiva. There were a few cells in the anterior chamber, uh, but uh, the macular CT was good, had a little bit of early MD, no macular edema. Uh, the patient was dilated by a optometrist to check the back of the eye, but there was not any uh, inflammation. There was a little bit of blepharitis, as it's common in elder patient. A leaflet was given to advise leaf hygiene, warm compresses, and uh, that her local optician can put support here further with this. Um, the diagnosis was uh, post-operative inflammation, post-operative uveitis, that we can see sometimes uh, these patients have a dense hard cataract, so treatment for like three to four weeks with the topical steroids and the, and the antibiotic is not enough, and uh, they can uh, present four to six weeks after with a very mild um, inflammation, these patients, again, are treated with a topical steroid as correctly done by our optometrist, gave Maxidex, and slowly tail them down. But in this case, instead of discharging the patient, you bring back the patient a few weeks time to make sure that the inflammation has completely settled. Another case, number six, with halfway there, 64-year-old um, patient previously treated with, uh, for uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, many various sessions of PRP, so extensive PRP in both eyes, had successful cataract surgery four weeks ago, but before going to his optician on the four uh, weekly appointment, uh, two days uh, before, I find the vision very bad in the right eye, and uh, the optician who does the post-op checks uh, did not manage to see the funders, so he was referred urgently to the clinic, as you understand why. Um, on examination, there were cells in the anterior chamber and the, the fundal view was not good. The differential diagnosis would be a hemorrhage, another vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment, but it's less likely due to the extensive PRP, so likely to be hemorrhage. In this case, our optometrist found one of our doctors who did an ultrasound, a B-scan, that uh, confirmed there was not any uh, retinal detachment, so it was likely a hemorrhage. Uh, so despite having a very good PRP, sometimes you can have a vitreous hemorrhage. And the plan is to see the patient after a few weeks time, uh, 
hopefully the hemorrhage will settle. If it doesn't, then you have to consider referring this patient to have a vitrectomy and endolaser because uh, when you do the laser, there are some areas in the periphery that uh, you cannot reach with a laser. So only intraoperatively, you can uh, do this uh, with a laser uh, following vitrectomy. And as you understand, again, in this case, it's a case to exclude any urgency and then forward the patient in, um, in a specialist clinic. Now, a uh, seventh case, uh, we have a patient, 70 year old patient, glaucoma patient, which did not have a good response uh, with uh, previous drops and um, various drop chains. And finally, it was changed with alpha gun, that would be brimonidib and timolol. The patient was doing very well uh, for six, seven months, but then again, referred by uh, GP with the red swollen eyes. Um, and for that occasion, the GP started using some uh, chloramphenicol, but this the swelling got worse and uh, it started spreading and the patient was referred in clinic. So on examination, this patient has a periocular dermatitis and follicular conjunctivitis, so all redness around the eye. It definitely appears to be an allergic reaction, but it's difficult to say whether it's from the brimonidine or the preservative. The suggestion was to stop all drops and reviewing clinics in two weeks to make sure it's resolving and likely to need uh, considerable listing for SLP to treat the glaucoma. Uh, this is the photograph of the patient in clinic. Uh, you can see the periorbital swelling and the dermatitis. This is actually typical and characteristic of brimonidine. Um, you can have some um, redness or persistent redness from the preservatives, uh, but this kind of swelling is more uh, typical of uh, brimonidine, I have to say. Um, in this case, uh, as uh, our optometrist did very well to stop all the treatment for 10 days, nothing's going to happen if the patient stops in 10 days. The patient has noticed a dramatic improvement on their symptoms in stopping all drops. And so it's likely intolerance to the brimonidine and possibly also intolerance to the preservative. So this is still uh, taken into consideration. The other problem, though, is that the glaucoma still needs to be addressed. The patient has a superior hemifid loss and the left eye has developed an arcuate defect. The discosity shows extensive RNFL thinning and uh, inferior list, uh, rim loss. And the pressure was around 17 with no drops. The patient baseline was around 20 and 18. So this case, after the 10 days of uh, drops holidays, was discussed with a glaucoma consultant, and the patient was listed for uh, urgent SLP and review closely. And the patient had actually SLP, um, but it was not uh, successful. The pressure was still around 18 following SLP. And the patient then um, had um, preservative-free thematoprost, the 0 0.3, the single dose one. And the patient was getting very well. The pressure was around 13, 12 with that and did not report any problems. So we're just uh, monitoring uh, the situation at the stage with follow-ups in the glaucoma clinic. And uh, this is a summary. You can see the photograph before and then 10 days after, uh, you can see that the, the dermatitis and the swelling has improved. The redness has improved a little bit, but uh, as you understand, that might be intolerance also to the preservatives, but the patient feels much better. And there is a plan. Uh, patient is happier right now with the uh, uh, current treatment with um, the Matopro 0.3, the preservative free. Uh, and if there is any change or any progression, then we might have to consider a surgical solution. Eighth case, have a 50, sorry for all these busy slides, but this is actually the notes from um, our optometrist and they show how thorough they are on checking everything. I wouldn't actually do anything different uh, from, than our, uh, col from my colleague who actually saw this, uh, these cases on, on, on her own. So 54-year-old patient referred by the optician for right eye keratitis. And the past three months has been getting this on and off red sore eye, treated with Thelos Duo, changed to Hycosan Dual every hour without much relief. The Hycosan ointment, 
heat masks uh, every evening. Um, the right eye on examination had some conjunctival uh, hyperemia, so a little bit conjunctival injection. In the lead inversion, no papilla, but there was lots of uh, conjunctival injection. Inferiorly, there was a uh, staining on the lower part of the cornea. Tear break eye time was checked, low. Serum test was seven millimeters. No cells, no, so no inflammation, no edema. The left eye, low tear breakup time and low shear test, uh, but there was not any significant uh, staining, but uh, no hyperemia. So the right eye was more involved. After all these investigations thoroughly documented, uh, it's actually very hard to establish uh, what the cause of the ocular surface inflammation is, because it could be chronic dry eye, but also the patient had the thyroid problems, but motility was checked. No, there was not any current proptosis. Also, we have to consider Sjogren, and uh, the patient has noticed a little bit of dry mouth as well. So a letter was done to the GP to consider uh, checking thyroid function test and markers for Sjogren. And if they're positive, uh, we might have to consider rheumatology referral. So you can see how thorough um, my colleague has been in clinic. Uh, without any advice uh, from a consultant for the, for the examination. As an incidental finding, no, though, uh, on the right uh, lower lid, there was an indentation of the lid. Unfortunately, I don't have any photograph of that. Other, that was not only in the last couple of weeks. So luckily, there was an echoplastic consultant next door who examined the patient and advised the safe biopsy on the right lower lid and the Cosentiva and make sure that there's nothing else suspicious in that area. Um, but also advise not to treat with steroid or other anti-inflammatory drops like a Kervis cyclosporin until the biopsy is done. And uh, then the patient is gonna be seen in the corneal clinic after biopsy. So these cases are, were seen like 10 days ago, um, a week ago, actually. So I don't know the outcome of this, but just to let you know how recent these cases um, are but how they're dealt in an acute setting to exclude something urgent. Ninth case, uh, we have a 59-year-old patient. Uh, Self-referral had cataract surgery a couple of days ago. The eye has been red and painful and hasn't got any better. Actually, the patient refers being worse. Lots of mucus discharge as well. On examination, uh, conjunctival hyperemia, so conjunctival injection and dis mucus discharge. The surface of the eye is very dry, not specific staining, and the cornea is intact. Sedil was, sedil was checked and was negative, so it's not any leakage from the wound. It's only two days after the surgery. There were some cells in the anterior chamber. You expect that two days following cataract surgery. The patient was dilated, the vitreous was clear, no inflammation found, the fundus appears healthy, no signs of endothelmitis because this is what you think of two days following cataract surgery, the patient comes back calling, my eyes worse, they have discharge, so the patient was seen uh, right away and uh, endothelmitis was excluded, this is the first thing. So we probably would treat him with a preservative uh, intolerance of the drops. This um, immediately would change the, to preservative-free formulations, uh, so chloramphemico 0.5%, preservative-free four times a day, and dexamethasone 0.1, uh, four times a day for four weeks, and uh, advise the patient to uh, contact us should there be any problem, and, uh, but keep the appointment by their local optician to make sure that everything is all right. Tenth case, um, then uh, we have a 71-year-old patient uh, on treatment with uh, anti-VGA factors for bilateral weight AMD. Uh, he was referred by Max, so a fellow optician, uh, for a left coronal ulcer. The patient left, uh, felt that the left eye was very sore and watery for at least one week, so managed to have an appointment with Max, which was referred. Once we saw the referral that it was treated for a corneal ulcer, the patient was seen on the same day, and it was found to have a left uh, corneal ulcer. There was a gray-white infiltrate with like bubbly appearance. Uh, these were the dimensions. There was a corneal scrape done, and... Um, there was like this white material lifted and leaving a thin area of ulceration, but not any actual infiltrate. The patient had previous seventh nerve palsy and has brow ptosis and mild, mild paralytic lower lid ectropion. 
immediate treatment with uh, exosin or floxacin will start half hourly until midnight and then hourly uh, overnight and review the following day, again by our uh, optometrist. The following day, um, as the patient had uh, treatment with exosin or floxacin hourly day and night, um, you could see the ulcer, but there was not any infiltrate. There was not any anterior chamber inflammation, no hypopion, the pupil was fine. So it was only anterior, the cornea was involved only. Um, there was a slightly improvement on the measurements, um, but the eye was more comfortable. Definitely the cultures would not be back in a day. And the plan was to continue to use uh, hourly exosin daytime and review Monday. That actually uh, was a Friday, so the patient was seen on a Monday gave to the patient advice that if the symptoms get worse, they, over the weekend, they would should seek the emergency um, on-call ophthalmologist. Now, the patient was seen two days after, on Monday. These are the photographs. So I apologize for the quality, I'm afraid. You can see there was a previous scar on the cornea. So this is an old scar, but when staining, this is the area affected uh, where the ulcer was. Um, it was getting much better. Uh, there was not any infiltrate, but uh, this was a little bit of a staining uh, on the cornea. And the reason for what has happened is that you can see in this uh, very brief um, video that there is the patient has a palsy. Sorry. Has a, the, the patient has a seventh nerve palsy and there is incomplete uh, lid closure. So this is actually from uh, exposure of the of the cornea. So this patient has been referred to the oculoplastic consultant to consider doing something about the brow ptosis and probably considering a, a lead weight in order to have a better closure of the lead to prevent further episodes like that from happening. And now again, a very busy slide, but this is just to show how thorough our optometrist is and I have to say that most of the times our optometrists, they tend to explain and take more time to explain things to the patients rather than me trying to get on to the next patient. Um, and the patients feel very reassured when they have a thorough explanation. Uh, so this is a patient, 71 year old patient, um, self-referral because the patient was not happy with the drops that uh, she was using. Um, the patient was diagnosed with a cutaneous horn, and, but they thought that it was developed as a consequence of taking a COSOP uh, because the patient was already on COSOP, was a glaucoma patient. When the patient stopped using COSOP, the horn dried and fell off. So the patient now is using Truzop preservative free and said the same issues are starting again. So intense stinging on insertion of the drops and irritated eyes, swollen lids for hours after. The patient uses um, Hycosan Extra pretty much hourly to help the comfort of her eyes and concerned about the cosmetic appearance of the eyes um, of her eyes on the drops. Uh, the patient reports that had drops from St. Thomas years ago and then was in Jamaica and probably was like prostaglitin analog and was advised that it would darken the skin. That's, the, that's what we thought. The patient said that didn't have any issues with, this, with these drops. And then um, she was seen again in Jamaica who changed the treatment to Combigan once a day. But then when the patient go, went back to St. Thomas, it went back to twice a day, which is Combigan supposed to be twice a day. So you see the whole, you have to take a good history from the patient. And unfortunately, when you don't have a good historian, then everything becomes very complicated, but you have to become an investigator to try to solve this, the, 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 this is a, a, a big riddle trying to solve and find what the problem is because the patient doesn't help you with uh, all this extra information that uh, it's not necessary. And you need to figure out what the problem is. On examination, there's bilateral pterygium, which is likely adding to the dry eye issues. So this is actually the patient's uh, problem. And that's why the surface of the eye is not very um, well lubricated. And uh, when using the, um, uh, the drops, um, it causes a little bit of irritation. And the fact that they didn't have the cutaneous horn was a different thing and not related to the cause of, 
So all this was explained thoroughly to the patient. And as you see, advised that the true Zopt is known on sticking on installation as its pH is low, um, but the patient was unhappy. So we tried to change it to monopost, warned about the side effects of monopost because the patient was concerned about the cosmesis of the darkened skin under the eyes. Um, and finally, this patient was listed for bilateral SLT because the patient would be happier and been less drops if possible. And also the patient reported also bad compliance. Um, so as you understand, all this takes time and you need to dedicate time. Uh, and I have to say that uh, our colleagues, our optometrist colleagues are very good at taking their time to explain all this thoroughly to the patient because I imagine this patient didn't have the ideas clear of what was wrong. Hopefully with this thorough explanation, the patient now is a little bit more aware of what the problem is and how to deal with. And finally, we got a 67 year old patient with already on treatment on the left eye with macular degeneration with ILEA injections. This was a self referral because the patient noticed a large blob in the center of the vision of the right eye. Uh, I'll go straight to the point. The macular OCT scan shows significant uh, subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid. And also there was a subretinal hemorrhage as well. The left eye, that, the eye that was already on treatment, there was a little bit of SRF. Um, in this case, uh, this is the OCT scan. Uh, this is the right eye. You can see here, I don't know, it's not very clear, but you can see that there is area is raised here. There's some SRF and Unfortunately, they don't have the opportunity to scroll down, but there was a little bit of intraretinal fluid as well, and the left eye has some uh, intraretinal, uh, subretinal fluid. So in this case, um, it, discussed, it was discussed that with a consultant right away uh, to consider starting treatment with uh, ILEA injections bilateral now. Um, the right eye will need loading dose and then PRM. The left eye was already on PRM, and it would be a big burden to bring the patient on the ILEA pathway, which is um, three uh, monthly injections and then an injection every two months. So better uh, have uh, a loading dose on the right eye and, and then PRN both eyes so it could be better coordinated. Bear in mind that we also started in our trust uh, Fabismo uh, for like two months now um, and we have uh, pretty good results and we have uh, great expectations from this medication and we see how it's going to evolve. We also plan to change our some switch some patients so with uh, already on treatment with ILEA and Lucentis to Fabismo, and we see how that's going to evolve. And uh, this is just about it. Um, these are all the cases. This is a day and a half of uh, our, of following uh, our optician who has seen um, these uh, cases, most of it on their own. The consultation from a consultant was only in three cases. All the other ones uh, were dealt uh, independently, quite successfully. And I have to say, most of these cases don't need any input from me or any of my colleagues. I'm very confident that uh, uh, our fellow opticians also, not necessarily in the hospital, but also in the community, are dealing and can deal with uh, these uh, conditions uh, quite thoroughly, especially uh, some post-op uh, problems or blepharitis or some uh, cases of iritis, especially if you are independent prescriber. So make things quite easier for everybody and avoid patients uh, coming to the hospital for this. Ian? I'm here, can you see I me? I don't know if I'm on time. Yeah, you, you've okay. done well, thank you very much. So the main point I took from that is that you work with some amazing optometrists, I think is what I can gather. Yes, actually, I can see one now, uh, but uh, also I have to say that uh, I, I'm very confident that our optometrists are very good. Not because I, and then my decision is a little bit partial because I know all of you guys and I work with you and uh, it's easy to, um, you know, when you know somebody, you trust them, you know how they work, you have a different relationship. Uh, so yes, I'm impartial because I know that our optometrists are very good. So I have high expectations from, from everybody, but I know how thorough you are on your work. So that makes my job much easier. So I'll pass that on to the optometrists that do rat clinics. 
if they're not on tonight. So we have a few questions, if I can pose them to you. So if you're ready. So the first one is, is aqueous misdirection the same as malignant glaucoma? Yes, yes, yes. that's another definition. It's easy to remember malignant glaucoma or aqueous misdirection. Usually it can happen uh, following, um, uh, following surgery. Um, sometimes it can, it can happen after, the, the strange thing with this patient that I described, because as I said, so far I've seen three cases of aqueous misdirection, three in my long career. Um, this patient had cataract surgery ages ago, years ago. Um, so you can see it in patients who had recent, fairly recent surgery. This patient developed this problem years after. So, and that's why it's unclear. The mechanism is, a, is, a, is unclear um, of how triggers and what happens. You can certainly, the, the, out of the three cases that I've seen, two cases were following cataract surgery. So a few weeks after cataract surgery. This one was years after. So a, a little bit tricky to figure out. So in your opinion, should all cataract referrals be self-treating for blepharitis? Well, the, to be honest, most of the patients in that age have some sort of blepharitis. And definitely following cataract surgery, uh, there is increased dry eye because we do incisions, the corneal nerves are affected, the patients have dry eyes or some sort of blepharitis. It depends on how symptomatic they are. So in an ideal world, you would consider treatment for blepharitis. Actually, in, I believe in, in the States, in America, most of the cataract surgeons uh, also treat right away dry eye with cataract surgery. So they go, they're all together. It's all blended together in the treatment for cataract surgery and dry eye. So they advise or blepharitis treatment. And also some of them are a little bit more aggressive. They start uh, pre prescribing cyclosporine right away for cataract surgery for long term. So ideally, yes. My view is if the patient is not, the patient might have some blepharitis, but if the patient doesn't complain about blepharitis or dry eye symptoms, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise or give the extra burden of this um, condition to control it with drops, cleaning the leads and everything. Only if the patient starts to refer problems, then I'm more than keen to try to help them, but not if they're not symptomatic. I don't know if that answers the question, but all, mainly most of the patients are cataract patients, elder patients, they have some sort of blepharitis. But I treat that only if they're symptomatic. Cool. So your talk tonight has been primarily about um, optometrists working at eye casualty at the hospital. Only. Yeah. Uh, do you would you do you have any advice you can give to optometrists in community that do MEX on how they should approach patients that come in? But but this is this is exactly why what I'm saying that the more cases that you see, the more confident you are. That's the reality, and that's why our optometrists work in hospital. They're more exposed to these uh, conditions, and they are. Uh, more confident on treating them. So if you have a patient that comes uh, four week following a cataract surgery and you see a few cells in the anterior chamber, and but you see as well there's not any, then you have the possibility maybe to do an OCT scan. You see the OCT scan is good. You don't see any vitritis or any inflammation. So probably treats that post-operative uveitis as, as I explained in one of these cases. So prescribing maxi, maxidex or a steroid if you are an independent prescriber, makes the, uh, the whole procedure much easier and the patient doesn't have to go to the hospital. So that's one case. Another case of preservative-free uh, medication uh, drops, another definitely easily can be dealt with the community. Um, I, ha I, I actually tried to put uh, conditions and the examples that we saw, I didn't manage to, I didn't want to filter too many things. So I took a day and a half uh, of cases that uh, had been seen, but in, in, in the hospital. Um, but most of the cases, I do believe that uh, are seen, but in the community and dealt with the community. The ones that we actually see here are the ones that you have an, an ulcer. If you have an ulcer, it has to be seen by us because we might have to do scrapes and similar stuff like that, more investigations. But I do strongly believe that not all the cases are from MEX are referred 
they are dealt by, by, by the community. Cool. I normally have lots of questions at this point, and I, I, well, someone else has just asked a question. Um, so do hospital optoms have to have IP qualifications? Not all of them, no, no. Not all of them. Actually, um, we have a few optometrists that do um, uh, casualty clinics. I believe there are three now. Um, and we also have another one in training. Uh, out of them, uh, one or two have our independent prescribers. If uh, there is an issue or an issue or any need to prescribe something, the uh, optometrist asks one of my colleagues, the doctor, to prescribe something, but uh, they usually come with a plan and uh, it's easy to write the prescription. So you don't have to be an independent prescriber. The truth is that once you start doing this kind of clinic, then you start seeking to become one because it's an extra skill at the end of the day. You, you can use it even in your uh, practice in the community, but also in the hospital. Uh, it gives you more confidence to and um, you facilitate the patient's treatment by giving them the treatment and then you can follow them up and definitely uh, if, if uh, you're not happy with the treatment, you can refer them to the hospital. I'm not IP, uh, I'm not an IP prescriber, so I always have to ask, can you prescribe this? Which is always very, very... Never uh, too late, Ian. Yeah. The, the optoms, the consultants are always happy to oblige when I say, can we prescribe this? Um, do the optometrists do scrapes? Um, not all the not all the time, but I have tried to teach uh, some of our optometrists to do scrapes. So it depends on the confidence. So if I have an optometrist, will some the, the optometrists that covered like a couple of ones are very experienced. So if you can take if you can remove a foreign body, you can definitely uh, consider doing some scrapes. So you don't have to, but if you feel confident, you can. So if you're around, I'll have a go at doing a scrape. If you're around to watch. Why not? <laughs> I think that is all the questions tonight. So yeah. you've got away lightly tonight, Mr. Iris. No, I uh, hope it was a little bit interesting. I, I, I repeat, I didn't want to filter things. So I just took a day and a half and I just uh, presented the cases um, to show how things are. Definitely, there are more complicated patients, patients with giant cell arteritis or uh, difficult neurolog neurological problems that they need uh, more attention. Uh, and, I'm, and I repeat, I wouldn't do anything different that my colleague has done in these clinics. I got one more question that's come up. Would mm -hmm. you prescribe a flaxin in community on a Friday PM before a scrape for ulcer? N you know what? If, if, if it is a contact lens wearer and uh, depending on the nature of the ulcer, the answer is no. I would, I'd rather have it seen by an ophthalmologist to take care of that, especially if it's on the weekend. So uh, that is my answer. I'd rather, I'd, ra I'd rather have it seen. If it's a tiny, 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 small infiltrate only with not any... Uh, not an not any corneal involvement, so not an actual ulcer, tiny infiltrate, then potentially you could consider that. But we're talking about very few cases. So if you have a contact lens related, probably uh, ulcer, no, I would not. I would not leave that uh, to be dealt with uh, in the community. I wouldn't like that burden to somebody else because you might have to follow the patient every day in these cases, and uh, I don't think that you have to do that so the answer is no better leave that better better send these patients especially contact lens wearers to the uh, to the ophthalmologist brilliant thank you very much Mr. Dines. and i should say possibly thank you to helen peregrine because i think she was probably the one that was doing the rat clinics you got the cases from is that yes, right? massive 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 thanks to helen i didn't want, didn't want to nominate here but you've done it well, but she's, she, she's very experienced. She actually knows more things than me, I'm quite sure. Um, that is, that's all about being exposed to cases, being confident, um, being familiar uh, with these cases. You, you That becomes second nature, how to deal with them. And very thorough documentation, very well from uh, my colleague, Miss Peregrine. 
Well, thank you very much again for your time. I know you've just come back off holiday, so you put this together very quickly. So thank you. Thank you everyone to you for all for watching. I'll get these certificates out fairly soon. Um, please keep an eye on the WhatsApp group for information coming up about future webinars. The next event that we're planning, uh, we'll post information about that soon. And uh, stay safe all. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Mr. Ionidis. Hi all, thank you for uh, dedicating your Thursday uh, evening and not seeing the game. <laughs> I'll look at the score now. Lovely. Thank you very much, all. Bye. 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 Bye.